We've just finished solving an OR gate type problem using a single neural uh, unit. And what I'm going to do next is uh, change up the problem just a little bit so we can get a little bit more intuition as to how a single unit can work. So the, what I have here already is our uh, solution. Uh, so in particular, we uh, ended up, given our parameters of 10, 10, and negative 5, we ended up with uh, outputs from our single neuron that look like this, which approximate what we're trying to achieve, zero, the 0, 1, 1, 1. What I'm going to do next is change up the problem. So I'm going to change this 1 to a 0 and this 1 to a 0 here. And hopefully this looks familiar. This is what we refer to as an AND gate. And the question is, what do we need to do in order to change our parameters to be uh, successful here? So in, in this particular case, this row here, we already are producing a correct answer. Likewise for this row here, but the middle two rows are the ones that are problematic in this case. The, the, ob the simple observation here is that uh, we have a very negative number here, a very positive number here, and we have this intermediate value uh, for our net input into the, the unit that is, th those are both above zero. What if we uh, shifted everything such that the first row is still negative, the last row is still positive, but these two intermediate rows are also uh, negative? So let's give that a try. What that sort of suggests is we can leave our parameters, our weight parameters to be the same, these weight parameters here, but perhaps we can get away with just changing our bias term to something else. So I'm going to change that to negative 15. What that means is that our net input for row zero is now negative 15 because this term is zero plus this is zero and there's our negative 15 right there. The second row, now the net input is uh, negative five. So this is one here, this is zero here, and we have uh, 10 and 10 and negative 15. So that gives us a total of negative, negative five. For this row here, the relationship changes. The zero and one change space, uh, change places, and, but that still gives us uh, a negative five as the net input. And then finally, when both of the inputs are one, we have 20 minus 15, which gives us a positive five. So looking up our values in this table here, a negative 15 translates into something very close to zero. Actually, that's not in our table. Negative five is the is symmetric to, to positive five. That gives us something on the order of about 0 0.01 or so. This also gives us a 0 0.01. And the positive five gives us a 0 0.99. So in this, with, with uh, this one change of our bias term, what we now have in uh, this column here is a quite close approximation to what we have uh, in our desired outputs, this Y column here. So with one change, we've gone from an OR gate to an AND gate. Let me give you a geometric interpretation of what has happened here. So imagine that we have this, uh, this space here where we have two axes that correspond to our x0 and x1. As we've talked about, each of these can take on one of two values. x0 can either be 0 or it can be 1. And likewise, x1 can either be 0 or it can be 1. So the, the very first row here corresponds to this point right here. And, and what we've expressed uh, in this Y column here is that we want the output to be uh, a zero. 
the next row down that corresponds to this point right here we also uh, have a, a a desired value of uh, zero here and uh, the third row is this point right here which has a desired value of zero and then finally the last row we have a desired output of of one and fundamentally what our neural element is doing in, in selecting these parameters is that we're fitting a function in the, the third dimension where we have zeros at each of these points here and then uh, a one sitting up over here so in some sense one can think of the x0 x1 living in a, in a plane like this and and then that third dimension the output of this neural unit uh, is living in in the third dimension here because we have a sigmoidal output we necessarily take on a a sigmoid type shape it might look like that from one perspective and uh, as we change our w's we we will change uh the, the orientation of of this s curve will also change how quickly we transition from the bottom here to the top up here so so uh, one possibility is to make a very sharp change or to have a very shallow change. Uh, and we can also shift the, the, this curve along uh, this dimension as well. So we can, we can place it anywhere that we want. Uh, in some sense, that transition from the, the, the lower plane to the, the upper plane up here, we can think of that as uh, being a curve. And because our uh, net input is just a linear function of the uh, of the inputs x0 and x1, that decision surface, so to speak, is uh, is a line. So, for example, that line might, in, in this case, we we so we ended up selecting a a line that lives somewhere about in here that divides our zeros from our ones. So, so down in this region here, we're in the flat part of the lower plane, and up in this region up here, we're uh, in the uh, the the uh, upper plane, and of course, there's some sort of a transition in between, and that's the S shape in in that piece of paper. When we were solving the OR problem, the difference here was that we had a one here instead, and a one here uh, instead, and all we had to do was shift the the line to go from AND to OR. We had to shift that decision surface down to this point here. So this is the the lower part of that plane, uh, and this is the the upper part uh, of of that uh, of that curve. So next, we're going to try an, another problem that has some other uh, interesting properties.